How's everybody doing today? Good. How about you? Good. Thank you. Hopefully nobody takes their laptop into the bathroom with them in this class, like what happened in my last class. They accidentally turned on their webcam while they were in the bathroom. That was not fun. <laughs> So yeah, we'll get started in just a minute, give people a second to log in. Uh, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna finish up the bio, biology slides, and then we are going to go over the exam review. It is posted, but it's really short. And then we'll talk about the exam sum. I'm actually probably gonna go, try to go really fast through these slides. Um, I know I get long-winded sometimes and I get just talking about things, but I need to get through these slides so I got enough time to talk about the exam because that's more important than what's in these slides. And then uh, you'll have that. Um, there's not too many questions on the exam from these slides. There's a few, but not too many from this set of slides. Does anybody have any questions before we get started? All right, so this is where we left off, talking about action potentials. Get word out of the way. Talking about action potentials and resting state of the neuron. Um, and one of the things I said is that when it fires, when a neuron fires off from the terminal buds, you get a release of neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters then so they go off this way, they then bind to the dendrites of the next neuron. Um, neurotransmitter specifically is a chemical messenger that transmits information between the nerves. So there's some main neurotransmitters we're gonna talk about. Some hormones act as neurotransmitters. So when we talk about things like testosterone, they can act as a neurotransmitter, but they're not one of the main neurotransmitters that we deal with. But it, it's an interesting thing to note, to add to it, that some hormones either act as neurotransmitters or do things in addition. Also, a lot of medications that we have, drugs, various different things like that, act as neurotransmitters in a way. They will either block receptacle sites or do various different things. Uh, so when we're talking about all of these chemicals that we put into our body or our body releases, they act or adjust neurotransmitters because neurotransmitters are essentially what is making us function. It is what's making us move. It's what's making us think, or I shouldn't say making us. It is what is allowing us to or aiding in that. There are two types of neurotransmitters, two major categories. There's more than this, but there's two major categories that neurotransmitters are going to fall into. There's excitatory, which increase neuro firing. So neurons fire more often when excitatory neurotransmitters are released. And then there's inhibitory, which decrease firing of neurons. So inhibitory, inhibitory, there are neurotransmitters that are released, but they actually will make a neuron, a subsequent neuron less likely to fire. Anytime there are neural activity, anytime there's activity going on, there's going to be both of these released at the same time. You're going to have both excitatory and inhibitory released. What is important is, is sometimes more excitatory will be released and sometimes more inhibitory will be released. So that is what will keep the action potential from happening. Part of the, when we're talking about going back to this for just a second, part of this is, is neural firing is an all or nothing thing. It either fires or it doesn't. It doesn't have a weaker charge if it's, if it's a weak thing or a stronger charge. No, a neuron either fires or it doesn't. It's, it's basically a yes or no type thing. Inhibitory and, and excitatory neuro neurotransmitters basically increase the chance or decrease the chance of that firing occurring. 
And we're not getting into it. If you take a brain and behavior class, there's just so much more going on here. You have other chemicals that, that increase uh, excitatory neurotransmitters. You have other chemicals that increase inhibitory. You'll have other chemicals that block um, the, the sites where neurotransmitters bind to, block binding sites. There's all these different types of things that are occurring. It's not as simple or as easy as just a neuron fires, it releases some excitatory neurotransmitters that those bind to the next one, the next neuron fires. It's not as easy as that. We're boiling it down to that in this class, but note that there is, it is way more complex than that. The most common six neurotransmitters is what you see here. Um, actually, there's a seventh that, that should be on this list. Um, that you actually see here on the right. And then there's an eighth that is a category here. So you have acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is basically involved in thought, learning, memory, um, those types of things. So that's what we've got here. Uh, and it really is going to be one of the main excitatory neurotransmitters. It, in, it increases all these things that go on in the body. Then you've got dopamine. Dopamine is related to pleasure, but addiction. Um, basically, dopamine is really strongly linked to uh, conditioning. So when we talked about conditioning, dopamine is really what's going on in the brain during conditioning. You got glutamate. The next one, glutamate is for um, learning, memory, it's actually the most common brain neurotransmitter. It, it is essentially our brain is full of glutamate. When you've got neural connections going on, glutamate is what's going on. Um, then you've got norepinephrine, which is also called noradrenaline. And conversely, you've got uh, epinephrine or adrenaline. Um, these are related to each other. Uh, noradrenaline is involved in concentration and attention. Adrenaline is involved in stressful situations. Serotonin, um, which is going to be related to happiness. Sorry, I had to sneeze. So serotonin is related to, to happiness and also related to our sleep-wake cycle. GABA is a, another very common one, very strong one, and uh, it it's basically improves focus, um, lowers anxiety, those type of things. And then beyond that, we have a category of neurotransmitters called endorphins that are released during exercise, excitement, sex. Um, they, they give us euphoria and those type of things. They reduce pain. So these are our main eight categories mean basically seven neurotransmitters with the eighth being a category. And if you take a brain and behavior class, go into those in each of those in much more detail. Let's move on to the brain or let's the nervous system in general. So first we have the central nervous system. We have two different systems, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system is the brain and spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system is everything else, everything outside of the spinal cord. So once neurons leave the, the spinal cord, they become part of the peripheral nervous system. It goes to the muscles. Um, it goes to the senses. And so the peripheral nervous system is going to be made up of nerves. So we've been talking about neurons to this point. The peripheral nervous system is made up of nerves and nerves are bundles of neurons. Let's first talk about the peripheral nervous system and then we'll come back to the central nervous system and talk about the brain because there is less to talk about with the peripheral nervous system. So the peripheral nervous system is basically responsible for bringing information from the senses into the central nervous system and sending information out from the central nervous system to the muscles and body's organs. So it's essentially a system of going from 
the outside to the central nervous system, then from the central nervous system to the outside. One of the important things or one of the big differences between the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system is that neurons in the peripheral nervous system can regrow or reattach. If you have a finger cut off, you can have your finger stone back on and the neurons um, and the nerves that are, are attached there will reattach, they'll regrow. Um, you might lose some sensation in your finger. You might, all of them might not regrow, but enough will regrow that you can still feel in your finger. Whereas when you have injuries in the spinal cord and the central nervous system, it, they don't regrow. The big difference there is, and this is a bit beyond the scope of this class, but the big difference is there is scar tissue. In the central nervous system, when you have a severing of nerves, scar tissue immediately forms. And that blocks those nerves from reattaching. And uh, that's it. the only reason I bring that up is because science and medical science is now finding ways to remove that scar tissue. So there, there's actually people who are um, who have had severed spinal cords, who are paraplegic and quadriplegic, who are now getting sensation back. They're, they're able to, with surgical procedures, they're able to get sensation back because we figured out how to remove that, that scar tissue and reattach those nerves. There's two subdivisions of the peripheral nervous system. There's the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. And then within the autonomic, there's a breakdown, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. Let's actually look at those. So the somatic nervous system is essentially the system that connects the nerves to the spinal cord and then the spinal cord to the muscles. So you basically, you'll have a, um, you have here a, a sensory, so it, it senses, um, which way, nope, I, I did the wrong one. So we've got a sensory um, neuron here. The information will go from that sensory neuron to the spinal cord. And then from the spinal cord, it goes to the brain, but also you notice that in the spinal cord, there's a connection here that then will go out to the muscles and telling the muscle mo to move. So it's a system that's interconnected. It doesn't even need the brain to activate. We'll talk about that in a minute when we talk about reflexes, but it doesn't even need the brain to fully activate, but it's a system that goes from the senses to the spinal cord, then back out to the muscles we, it allows us to sense in things in our environment as well as voluntarily move our muscles. However, over here on the right, you see the reflex. We'll have a slide on that where something occurs that, that it entirely skips going to the brain. If the sensation will still go to the brain, but the muscle will move without the information even having to go to the brain. So the reflex occurs in the spine. The other peripheral nervous system is the autonomic nervous system. And this is the nervous system that is more automatic, autonomic, automatic. The autonomic is an automatic. Uh, am I breaking up for other people or just K Kaya? Okay, so it must just be her. Okay, it must just be her. Okay, I'll, I'll keep going. Hopefully she can reconnect. Um, so the autonomic nervous system is automatic. It's, it, um, uh, it basically, it regulates things like our heart rate, our breathing, our blood pressure, our digestion. Yes, we can adjust things like our breathing, but at the same time, it is something that is typically automatic. Um, and all these different functions um, come down to, to uh, the fact that these are automatic things that happen and when we're looking at this, when we break it down, we've got the sympathetic nervous system, the sympathetic division. And this is our essentially the four Fs. 
Um, it's typically talked about as fight or flight. Basically, when something stressful is in our environment, we, it, our body, our, our physiological arousal raises. Our breathing increases, our heart rate increases, um, our blood pressure will increase, our digestion will actually decrease because um, energy is diverted from digestion to, to things like heart rate. And um, it's, it's traditionally called the fight or flight, but it's actually involves the four Fs. Um, I'll only say three of them. So we've got fight, flight, freeze, or sex is the, the fourth one. Um, and it's basically the, the um, division that, that activates when these things in our environment, either stressful or sex as well, comes into that where it, it's getting our body ready to be active. Then the opposite of that is the parasympathetic division or the parasympathetic nervous system. And this is what returns our body to a relaxed state. So the, the uh, sympathetic increases arousal the parasympathetic decreases arousal back to the resting state. And homeostasis is basically where the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems work together to keep the, the, the level of arousal in balance for optimum functioning. If we need to run or, or anything like that, it, it runs back to the sympathetic and we have an increase there. However, if we don't, it runs back to the parasympathetic and it gets us back to baseline. Okay, give me just a second. I said I'd come back to this. So a reflex, it's unlearned, it's involuntary. And basically what happens is, is it comes from, let's say the stimulus is a pain. It comes from the senses. It goes in to the spinal cord. Yes, information does go to the brain, but information also goes directly to the motor neurons. It goes back to the muscle, and we pull away from the pain. As in, it does not have to get all the way to the brain for us to pull back away from the pain. It's something that happens automatically. Now, that doesn't mean that it's, um, that it, it is a given. That doesn't mean that it's going to happen. One of the things with reflexes is, is our brain can override that. If you know you're about to touch something hot, the brain will send information down and it will basically block that reflex from happening. Let's say you know you're about to pick up a pan that's hot but isn't going to scald you or you're about to put your hand in, in warm water, hot water, but not boiling water, something that isn't going to burn you. Your, your natural reflex is going to be to pull away, but our brain, knowing that we're about to do that, can override that reflex. So reflexes aren't fixed. They aren't given. In the absence of conscious thought on what we're doing, the reflex will occur, but conscious thought can overcome reflexes. All right, now let's move on to the central nervous system. First, we have to talk about how we measure the central nervous system, how we study it, and that is through cognitive neuroscience. And they study it through brain scans. Mainly, these are different techniques that look through the skull take a picture of the brain. Some of them just look at electrical activity. Some of them look at blood flow. Some of them look at, at various different things in the brain. But by doing this, uh, researchers can map out a very variety of functions that are going on in the brain. Most common one types of brain imaging are MRI and fMRI. Actually, the fMRI is the most common now. MRI is referred to as magnetic resonance imagery. Um, and basically it's where radio frequencies are passed through the brain to produce detailed images of the brain. The, it, it still has issues. MRI is still not perfect. fMRI is much better, but fMRI isn't actually um, giving 
detailed pictures of brain structure, fMRI is giving pictures of blood flow. So what you see he, over here is a uh, functional MRI, fMRI, and it's basically measuring change in blood. So it's measuring blood flow. Those regions that you see in red have an increase in blood flow. The regions that are in gray don't have no blood flow. They just don't have a increase in blood flow. So the regions, regions in red actually have an increase in blood flow when whatever's going on is happening. So the, the person might be in an fMRI machine and they're told to think about a certain thing. And then the scientist is trying to see which regions of their brain activate. And basically activation is measured by increased blood flow. If there's more blood flow, that means that region of the brain is working and it needs that, that increase in blood flow. We also do PET scans, if I can get the slides to change. PET scans are uh, PET scans, basically where a radioactive solution is injected into the blood and then the, the amount of radiation that is absor absorbed by neurons when they activate is measured. It's an amount of radiation that is not harmful. It is some, an amount of radiation. It's radiation that can go through the blood-brain barrier. That's one thing that, that sh we should talk about just real quick, just a quick tangent. Um, the brain, it has what's referred to as the blood-brain barrier. Blood flow from the body, um, it goes into the brain, but it doesn't, the, the stuff that's in the blood doesn't fully get into the brain. Uh, there's a barrier so the brain prevents a lot of chemicals in the blood from getting into it. Not all. That's why we still can get high on various things. Certain drugs still work, but some things do not. Um, that's that blood brain barrier is there to prevent neurotoxins and stuff like that from getting into the brain and easily killing us. Um, every time you get food poisoning, if, if the blood brain barrier wasn't there, it could easily kill you. So the blood brain barrier is there to prevent you from dying from from toxins in the blood. Uh, one of the things though is a certain things like the, this radioactive solution does go into the brain. It can get past the blood brain barrier. Uh, in basically looking at uh, various different structures in the brain. EEG, this is one that's measuring surface electrical activity on the brain. So electrodes are placed on the surface of the scalp. Um, if you ever do a sleep study, they do an EEG. I'll talk about that when we talk about sleep later. Um, but EEGs uh, basically are measuring electrical activity on the surface of the brain. So it doesn't work as good on deeper structures of the brain. It works really good on the surface structures. Um, when when we talk about this, we should talk about genes. Um, so we're going to look at genes and DNA and, and dominant recessive genes. Just a quick overview of that before we get back to the central nervous system. So genes are genetic information. Um, basically, that, that they, they contain complex chemical instructions written into the human cell that determine uh, basically everything of who and what we are. And the the boils down to DNA, which we'll get on the next slide. As I said, this is basically an overview. We'll talk about some of this more in, in the developmental section, but uh, fertilization. Fertilization occurs when the father's sperm uh, penetrates the mother's egg. Each contain 23 chromosomes. So chromosomes are basically short rod-like structures that contain tightly coiled DNA. When these come together, when the sperm comes together with the egg, it forms a zygote. The zygote is the fertilized egg that contains now 23 pairs of chromosomes or 46 chromosomes. And this again makes up who we are. This determines who we are and just about everything about us. When you have environmental things that occur, they basically can cause changes on the minor changes on to the DNA. Um, we'll talk about epigenetics later. We'll talk about things where the DNA can stretch and contra contract, um, but that's beyond the scope of this slide, this set of slides. 
though one thing to talk about is is dna is made up in base pairs for chemicals and it's basically a almost like a computer code um, it's a ladder that's twisted on itself um, the genes are going to be specific segments of the dna that contain um, basically instructions for making proteins so one thing to do it and again i'm trying not to get too complex here is that this DNA here um, will split and um, chemicals will bond to the split. The chemicals that bond to the split then peel off. These things that peel off are proteins. Then the chemical, then the DNA forms back together before it splits again and creates more proteins. But essentially, uh, the, there's more to it than this, but the, the basics, the, the TLDR is that the DNA splits and forms proteins before the DNA merges back together. And the proteins are chemical building blocks from which all parts of the brain and body are constructed. So our body, our, our brain, it's made up of proteins. And it, in a sense, when you look at it broken down, um, things that are occurring within a neuron are proteins. The, the structure of the neurons are proteins. The structure of the body is proteins. Everything in our body is essentially made up of proteins. When we're talking about genes, though, we have to talk about um, basically alleles. So alleles are um, with parts of genes that basically determine traits that we have. All, every, everything that makes up us up is made up of alleles. Alleles, you're going to have one or two different alleles. You can have up to two. You get one from your mother and one from your father. It, it basically comes on the chromosomes. You get these alleles and you, they can both be the same. You can have both that are the same, but you can have different ones. And these alleles determine what is expressed. So for instance, let's talk about eye color. Now, most traits that are, we have made up of, it's, it's actually a bunch of different genes put together to, to make up a trait. But let's say our eye color was determined by one specific gene. And your eye color is then determined by the alleles that you have. Let's say you've got an allele for two alleles for blue eyes. Well, if you've got two alleles for the same thing, then the trait you're going to have is going to be what those alleles are. So you would then have blue eyes. But let's say you had an allele for brown eyes and an allele for blue eyes. What trait is, is expressed? Do you have brown eyes? Do you have blue eyes? Do you have a mixer, mixture of the two? Well, this is where uh, dominant and recessive comes in. Dominant genes are expressed. When paired with a recessive gene, a dominant gene will be expressed. Brown eyes, brown is a dominant genetic trait. Um, again, it's made up of multiple, but we're kind of breaking it down for our example, but brown is a dominant genetic trait. So brown, when mixed with a recessive, which is blue, the dominant trait will be expressed. Therefore, you would have brown eyes. Recessive genes are only expressed if they're paired with another recessive gene. So you'd only end up with blue eyes if both of your genes are for blue. If you've got blue and brown, brown is dominant, you'll get brown. Only time you'd get blue is if both eyes are for blue. Incomplete dominance is kind of a, a side thing that's different than the other two. And incomplete dominance is where you actually get a mixing of traits. The majority of traits out there are going to be up here, dominant and recessive. However, some traits, you get incomplete dominance, which means you get a mixture of the two alleles. Uh, let's say you had red flowers and white flowers. The allele is for red and for white. You could get a incomplete dominance where you get a mixture where you get pink flowers instead. So I'm not going to go into it more than that. That is just, you've got Punnett squares down here that you draw out where you've got one allele and the other allele and what comes out of it. I'm not concerned with all of that for in here. 
biology goes into that in much more detail. Um, most of you have probably taken a biology class um, that, that covers stuff like this. So this shouldn't be new to you. It's just, I, I, I wanted to cover it. If you have more in-depth classes, like I said, brain behavior, stuff like that, you'll go into this much more. All right, now let's get back to the central nervous system. The central nervous system has three main components. You've got the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. Um, the forebrain is going to be more of the, uh, actually, I should just talk about it like this. In terms of evolutionary development, evolutionary developmental order, the hindbrain is the oldest, the midbrain is middle, and the forebrain is the newest. In, in mammals, in, when we look at humans, we can go back from there. That's why the, the um, midbrain and hindbrain are sometimes called the reptile brain. Um, it, it goes back to that. That's not technically correct, but when we look at it like that, we get the newer structures, the, the higher you go there. Doesn't mean the hindbrain and midbrain haven't continued to, to evolve. It just means they were as structures earlier in our evolutionary history. So the forebrain, um, which is um, basically the, the newest part is the largest part of the human brain. Uh, the forebrain is essentially going to take up uh, everything that you see there in pink. Um, and the forebrain has hemispheres, right and left hemispheres. And it's responsible for basically all of our higher order thinking and, and feeling and understanding. It's responsible for learning, memory, speaking language, emotional responses, experiencing sensations, initiating voluntary movements, planning, making decisions. It essentially is the, the main part of our brain. That's the easiest way to explain it. Uh, some of the other parts of the brain do overlap with some of these things like we'll talk about um, movement and how the hindbrain is involved in that as well but the the forebrain is the main part for that the forebrain can be divided into and oh let me talk about this real quick i'm going to talk about it give you a whole bunch of structure names um just know the generals of these. You don't need to know the specifics of each of these. I might ask a question like, um, each of the following are lobes of the brain, except instead of what is the frontal lobe responsible for? I, I don't won't necessarily ask that. I'll ask what are each of these are, are lobes of the brain, frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, and auditory lobe is something I might say instead of occipital lobe. And so there you would say the auditory lobe. So um, the, the cortex, it's part of the forebrain. It's the thin layer of cells that essentially cover the entire surface of the brain. And there are four lobes of the cortex, the frontoparietal, occipital, and temporal. Let's cover each of these. So first is the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is the, the region you see here. Um, it's located in the front of the brain um, and it's basically the, the most important structure in our brain. All of the structures in our brain are important, but it's the most important structure in our brain for making us human. It is involved with our personality, our emotions, our motor behaviors. It's responsible for our executive functions, such as paying attention, planning, organizing, making decisions, thinking. It's responsible for memory. Essentially, the, the frontal lobe is the, the lobe that sets us apart as part as human. Um, other mammals have a frontal lobe. It's just not as developed or not as intense as ours is, as humans is. Um, one of the examples we can use with things that happen if you've got damage to the, the frontal lobe. Um, so there's Phineas Gage. Phineas Gage, if you've never heard of him, Phineas Gage was a railroad worker, um, and it, this was back, back in the 1800s. And basically, a metal rod weighing 13 pounds, a huge metal rod, was driven through the front of his skull. 
Um, it was driven up underneath his cheek and went through the top of his skull. He survived, though. Most people would die of this. He actually survived. Um, prior to this accident, he was very calm, very mellow, very, he was always happy. He was always joking. After this, he was very emotional. He, he had problems making decisions. He made a lot of mistakes in decision making. Um, he started drinking. He had emotional outbursts. All of these things because he had damage to the part of his brain responsible for decision making and emotional regulation. So it, it just one of those that shows what was going on here. Obviously, you get major accident like this, even if there wasn't damage to the brain, you'd have changes to your behavior. But a lot of the changes to his behavior went above and beyond what you'd expect for just an accident. Um, other examples of things like this, frontal lobotomies, a, a surgical procedure um, that was done in the past. It's still done occasionally now, but it's rare. Where basically a, the frontal part of the brain is cut away, either severed through, they used to put spikes through the side of the eye socket and wiggled around the spike. Um, lobotomies were done that way. And basically a lot of the times where damage was done to this front part of the brain resulted in very similar type things where, where those who did survive it, it changed their, their way they acted and behaved in emotional and decision-making ways. Okay, that's the frontal lobe. The next is the parietal lobe, top back. Um, this is where the somatosensory cortex is. This is basically where information from the senses comes in uh, with the exception of uh, auditory and visual senses. Yes, you give auditory and visual sensation information processed in this region of the brain, but they're processed in this region of the brain after they're processed in their primary region of the brain. This is basically where um, all of the information, all of the sensory information is integrated in the brain. So sensory information from the body, but also where you integrate um, two different senses together. So if you're, if you're talking about something that you can both see and hear, it's integrated in the parietal lobe for, so that we know that we, that thing that we're hearing is the same thing that we're seeing. And there's some memory that goes on in this region. There's some processing like counting that goes on in this region, but it's mainly, mainly going to be for the sensory region. The next is the temporal lobe. This is the sides. Um, this is mainly for memory and auditory cortex. So this is where we process all the, the first place where we process auditory information coming in. So information that we hear. So it's involved in hearing and speaking. It's got the auditory association area. Um, so things we hear come in through this, things that we say go out through this as well. So we'll talk about this later when we're talking about language and we'll talk about damage to this part of the brain and how that can change how we hear and speak. The final lobe is the occipital lobe in the back. This is responsible for vision, uh, where the primary visual cortex is. So this is the first area. So the information comes in through our eyes. It goes back to the back of the brain into the occipital lobe before it is processed. And it is processed there and then sent to other regions of the brain for understanding. But there's different regions back there and could go into this in great detail how the different regions process vision. Just know that processing vision is a very, very complex process that occurs in the occipital lobe. That's why there's an entire lobe of the brain that is responsible for just vision. Damage to the occipital lobe can cause visual agnosia. Agnosia is basically going to be where you've got a lack of something. We'll talk about auditory agnosias later, but one of the visual agnosias is where you have difficulty recognizing objects. Uh, person, faces. So the prosopopagnosia is where you have difficulty rec no, recognizing faces. Um, I, I dated a girl once who, who had this. She couldn't recognize faces at all. She'd had a traumatic brain injury when she was 17 and she could not 
recognize faces after that. She had to go by people's uh, features, like their shirts they wore. Um, I wore distinctive shirts at the time, so she always could recognize me by my shirts. She could recognize me by facial hair too, by my voice, but she couldn't, she, if I didn't say anything, if I, if I had shaved off my beard, didn't say anything, wore a shirt that I'd never wore before, I could walk up to her and she would not have been able to recognize me at all. So these, these different regions of the brain that are responsible for this. Um, another one you see here, a uh, person asked to draw a, a horse. Um, they can draw basically different parts of the horse, but they can't put them together into one part because their brain doesn't process it together as one. There's some really interesting things that can happen with visual agnosia and auditory too, which we'll talk about later, but really interesting things that, that can happen with the brain where you can still see something, you can still explain what you see. Um, like, let's say they're shown a, there's a, a certain damage to the brain where they're shown a picture of the horse, they're asked what, the, what it is they're seeing. They, they cannot tell you they're seeing a horse, but they can tell you that they're seeing an eye, that they're seeing hair, that they're seeing structures. They could even redraw the horse for you but their mind cannot process that it's a horse. So our, our occipital lobe, it's very complex, it's very in-depth, and there's a lot of different damages that can occur that can cause different issues. Um, another one is neglect syndrome, um, where you see where basically uh, people won't process information in one area in front of them. So the patient was asked to draw a picture of the clock and this is what they drew. Um, it's and because their mind is, even though they're seeing what's on the left, their mind is not processing what's in the left of their field of view. Um, people with this then only process one half of their body. They may only dress on one side of the body. Um, they might even deny the opposite body part is part of theirs. If you have them lift up their left hand or hold their left hand in front of them, even though they can move it, they deny that it's part of them. So our brains are really weird is the best way to explain it. Between the right and left hemisphere, I said before, we've got right and left hemisphere. Between them, we've got the corpus callosum. That's a basically a connective tissue between the hemispheres of the brain, and it allows for the two parts of the brain to rapidly communicate with each other. If you cut the corpus callosum, the two parts of the brain cannot communicate with each other anymore. Um, so a split brain operation involves cutting it. Um, it's only done in extreme circumstances where people have extreme seizures, or where they're basically at risk of dying if they don't have something done and nothing else has worked. And cutting the corpus callosum can actually reduce the seizures. However, now the two parts of the brain aren't communicating with each other. And since our brain, even though um, being left-brained and right-brained is something that, that used to be a, a big thing, where, where one part of the brain is more analytical and one part of the brain is more emotional, we know now that both parts of the brain do both. However, we still know that, that one part of the brain does more analytical and one part of the brain does more emotional. When you cut this, basically the two parts of the brain aren't communicating anymore. So you can have people moving their, their parts of their body and not even realize they're moving it. Um, so uh, it, it really can cause, even within some, a person, it can cause conflict because part of their brain is, that's not communicating with the other part is trying to do one thing, whereas the other part of the brain is trying to do something else. Um, so, one of the things, and, and whether you're seeing the, the uh, dancer here spin left or right, most of you will probably see her spinning um, counterclockwise because of the skip in it. If you get this where there's no skip, um, some people see it spinning right, some people see it spinning left counterclockwise or clockwise. Does anybody see B it's spinning clockwise? Like I said, the skip yeah. makes it so you're, what's that? Oh, I said, yeah, I see it spinning the other B, way. clockwise. 
Yep. Most people, like I said, I'll see it spinning A because of the, where the skip is, but some people will still see B. And this is basically looking at different types of the parts of the brain are processing this. Um, so the, the, whereas that popular notion of right brain or left brain, it's exaggerated um, because of the corpus callosum going back and forth strongly. It's still, um, if, uh, you're, you're seeing a counterclockwise that is more, um, your, your brain is going to be more analytic, more mathematical. If you're seeing B, your brain is, is more, um, nonverbal, emotional, artistic, that type of thing. So that is, so those of you that are seeing B it's, it comes down to, and it doesn't mean anything definitively because again, the, our brains the two sides of our brain are rapidly communicating with each other, but it, it is an interesting thing there that um, seeing A and B, some people, as you're seeing in chat, some people see B, some people see A. And no matter how hard I try, I cannot see B. I try and try and try and try, and I just can't see B. I only see A, personally. This kind of reminds me of um, like how there used to be the thing about what color the dress is and other people see one color and the other person sees the other. <laughs> yeah, that that's part of it. Um, the dress one is is more in the eyes. Right. Whereas this one's more in the, the parts of the brain you're using, but it works under that same concept of different people having different things that are going on in their head, their brain, their senses that meaning we interpret the world different. It's also why when I was talking about the different um, subfields of psychology and one of them, um, when you're looking at gestalt psychology and one of the things in that is they say that, that reality is subjective um, because of things like this. Different people can perceive the world entirely differently. I've got to get through these. Um, so, um, the limbic system, it's going to be uh, a basically a group of about a half dozen interconnected structures, and these are involved with regulating many motivational behaviors, um, such as seeking out food, drink, sex, emotional behaviors such as fear, anger, aggression. Um, the main structures here are going to be the hypothalamus, the amygdala, the thalamus, and the hippocampus. Let's look at these each individually. Sorry, I'm going a little bit fast today, but I, I do want to get to the, to the study guide. So the hypothalamus is the main one when it comes to basically emotional response and emotional behaviors, as well as emotional drives. So eating, drinking, sexual response. Uh, if you didn't know, hunger is considered an emotion. Uh, so when we get to emotions later in the semester, we'll talk about that, but hunger is considered an emotion. Um, the hypothalamus is basically going to be the center of emotional behavior and response, as well as secreting hormones, um, things like that, that uh, the four Fs that comes from the hypothalamus. So the, the fight, flies, fight, freeze, or sex that comes from the hypothalamus. The amygdala is mainly involved in fear response. So fight, flight, freeze, um, that also comes from the amygdala as well. It processes from the amygdala into the hypothalamus, but the amygdala is, receives input from all the senses, and it is that first line of fear. If you have, if something is causing anxiety, stress, fear, something in the, the environment around us, the amygdala is what is processing that. Then we've got the thalamus. The thalamus is basically responsible for processing information from the senses. So it receives information from the senses and relays that to the appropriate uh, areas of the sensory cortex. Um, so even though um, the exception to this is visual and auditory, visual and auditory go through their primary reason, regions before they go to the thalamus or that's kind of a incorrect, they go to the thalamus in conjunction with going to their primary regions. That's a better way to say it. 
there, the, the information splits, some of it goes to the primary region, some of it goes to the thalamus. And then from the thalamus, it then goes into that, um, the somatosensory cortex, the region of the brain for processing sensory information. The hippocampus, on the other hand, it looks like a seahorse, or at least it's supposed to look like a seahorse. Um, that's what we've got here technically there. The hippocampus is involved with memory. So later on this semester, we're going to talk about memory and we're going to talk about um, Clive Waring and he's got uh, issues with memory. And basically Clive Waring had uh, a, a disease that caused his hippocampus to be destroyed. So he, he has issues with memory because of that. So the hippocampus is involved in memory. The endocrine system is all related to this. It all comes off the bottom of this. The endocrine system is basically the, the glands that are responsible for releasing hormones into the body. And we'll look at these real quick but we've got the pituitary gland, the pancreas, the thyroid, the adrenal glands, and the gonads. Um, and these are all the different systems in the body that release hormones. You notice all of these aren't in the brain, but the main one, the reason we are talking about it now in the central nervous system is the pituitary gland here. And because the pituitary gland, we'll get to that, the pituitary gland is the primary, the regulator gland, the master hormone gland. It tells the other um, glands when to release hormones. They don't release those hormones without the pituitary telling it. It's the master, it's the master gland, essentially. So it regulates salt and water balance. It regulates growth. It promotes um, basically all of these other regions of the brain and body that release hormones, the pituitary gland tells it when and how to do it. Then we've got the pancreas. The pancreas um, basically regulates sugar in the bloodstream and secretes insulin. And again, I'm going through these quick because you don't need to know the specifics of these, just know the general. The thyroid that's located in the neck and this regulates metabolism. The adrenal glands, um, these secrete hormone that basically give us uh, the, that um, help us with activity. So if we need to move, if we need to, to exercise, if we need to do things like run, um, these are going to be ones that are going to help with that. And they're going to release adrenaline and noradrenaline that arouse the body during stress and bring the body back to, to regular, um, to homeostasis. So when we talked about the, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system, the adrenal glands are a big driver of that. The final is the gonads, the, the sex organs, the sex glands. In females, this is the ovaries. So this will produce hormones that regulate sexual development ovulation, growth of the sex organs, all of this. Um, this is going to be mainly estrogen and progesterone. Females do release some testosterone, but mainly we're looking at the, the main ones are estrogen. Progesterone is in there as well. Then in males, it's the testes and the testes are producing testosterone. Other parts of the body can produce minor amounts of, of estrogen in males, but mainly in, in males, it's testosterone. And this testosterone regulates sexual development in males, production of sperm, and growth of the sex organs in males. We're not going to get into it more than that in here. Just note that the, the gonads are part of the endocrine system. They are glands that re release hormones that regulate basically sexual development, sexual drive, and the sex organs in males and females. Okay, the last two slides are the midbrain and hindbrain. I, I said these are earlier development regions, earlier evolutionarily developmental regions. Um, 
So the midbrain is is um, sometimes called the monkey brain. Uh, basically, it's the has areas for reward and pleasure centers. It's stimulated by food, sex, money, music, looking at attractive faces, drugs, things like this. It's also strongly tied to um, those that conditioning we talked about. So classical and operant conditioning are strongly tied to the midbrain. So this is the part of the brain that is more um, due to drives and instincts. So pleasure part of the brain. It does have areas still for the visual and auditory reflexes because this happens even before um, the information gets to the auditory uh, or the occipital lobe and the temporal lobe. And it contains what's called the reticular formation, which basically arouses the, the forebrain so that it's ready to process the information from the senses. Again, the forebrain is what we already talked about. The midbrain is basically priming the forebrain to be ready to get the information that's coming in from the senses. And then the final one is the hindbrain. And the hindbrain has three main distinct structures. The first is the pons. And this, the pons basically is the bridge between the spinal cord and the brain. The pons, okay, so the hindbrain is often called the reptile brain. The pons here, that is basically the bridge in processing information from the spinal cord to the brain. Then you've got the medulla. The medulla is located at the top of the spinal cord. And the medulla is responsible for a lot of our automatic systems. So the medulla um, controls things like breathing, heart rate, respiration, blood pressure, those types of things. It also is responsible for a lot for reflexes. So reflexes are, are controlled a bit by the medulla. So the medulla is, is basically an automatic thing. And then finally, you've got the cerebellum. The cerebellum is basically um, at the back of the brain. It's under, basically at the back underneath the brain here. And it's the cerebellum is involved in motor movement, in, in initiating um, basically automatic motor movement. When you're walking, uh, things like that. That's not a reflex. That's just something we do automatically. Um, it's the cerebellum is what's working here. When you're talking, your mouth is moving. You're not, you're not voluntarily telling your mouth, Hey, this muscle's got to move. Then this muscle's got to move. Then this muscle's got to move. You're, you're not telling your chest cavity to, to compress in certain ways. So the air is expelled. All of that, all of that is a, um, they're, they're voluntary movements but they're voluntary movements that are happening in a subconscious way. And that's happening in the cerebellum. Okay, is there any questions there? Like I said, I went through it really fast. I, I loved having discussion. We got to talk a little bit about the spinning A and spinning B, but I did want to get through it because um, we, we, I want to get that study guide. So we've got about 15 minutes to go over that study guide and, and answer questions and talk about the exam. So in this set of slides, we talked about neuroscience, neuron, neurotransmitters, reflexes, cognitive neuroscience. We look today at genes, nervous system, brain, the different regions of the brain, like the cortex. We looked at split brain. We looked at the limbic system and we looked at the end, endocrine system. Any questions there? Okay, let me get this shared. Okay, um, you should see the, the study guide there. It's not fully as big as it could be because it's in my small window, but that's fine. Okay, looking at this, our, so what is going to be? The exam is going to be 50 questions, multiple choice. You're going to get given the questions one at a time. I need to make sure to adjust so that you can, um, let me 
uh, make sure that I do that. Uh, I want to type a note. So give me just a second. I, I need to make sure that your uh, exam is that you can backtrack. So I used to prohibit, prohibit backtracking on the exam, but I understand that, that many people like to skip a question and go back to it later. So what I'm gonna do here is make sure that you can go and backtrack. Uh, the exam is not even available there. Okay, um, hopefully I remember. If for some reason you go in and take the exam and you can't backtrack, send me an email. I'll make sure to make adjustments if you can't. Okay, so it'll be one question at a time. It's closed book, closed note, closed internet, no internet, no book. If you take the exam on your own at home, it will be available from Monday to Tuesday. So basically from Sunday night at midnight till Tuesday night at midnight, it'll be available for 48 hours. You will need to use lockdown browser with monitoring for that though, if you're taking it at home. Just like with the practice um, quiz, the, the syllabus quiz, practice quiz, practice test, whatever I called it this semester, that that you did, the first assignment, um, you'll have to do it with lockdown browser and monitor. This is how I recommend you do the, the quiz, but, or the test, but you don't have to do it that way. You can do it in person. So if you do it at home, you'll have to use lockdown browser and monitor. If you come in and do it in person, which next week we're starting in person, you can do it. You can only take it on that Monday during class. So you're limited to that. You're limited to the class time, which is an hour and 15 minutes. Um, and if you want to, you'll have two options. If you come to take it in person, you'll have two options. One, you can take it on your computer in person. If you take it on your computer in person, you still have to use lockdown here. Good, I can still write on it, but you won't use monitoring. Um, I'll give you a code that you can put in that's basically say you're taking the, the, the exam in a proctored location. You'll still use lockdown, but you don't, won't have to use monitoring. So if you have a laptop that doesn't have a webcam or if the webcam isn't working with monitoring, you can come in and take it in person that way. If you want though, you can still take it on paper. So if you don't have a computer at all, or if you want to take it on paper, you can take it on paper. However, and I'll send out an announcement later this week, you have to tell me you're going to do that ahead of time because I need to print out copies. I'm not going to print out a bunch of copies. I'm not going to kill a bunch of trees and then nobody take it on paper. I'm only going to print out enough copies for people who actually tell me they're taking it on paper. So you have to tell me you're taking it on paper for me to, to have the copies for you to be able to take it on paper. So your three options, again, you can take it at home on any time from Sunday night to Tuesday night um, using Lockdown Browser with monitoring. You can take it in person using Lockdown Browser, but not monitoring, or you could take it in person on paper. I prefer you take it at home, but that's up to you however you want to do it. Okay, looking at this, things to study. Um, not everything that's on the study guide is on the will be on the exam and not everything that's on the the exam will be on the study guide. I do tend towards practical questions over definitional questions. So I like to ask questions. It's hard sometimes when you're doing stuff like with the biology stuff, but I tend to ask questions that are more in line with um, <clears throat> in line with giving you a situation and you having to answer the question from that situation. Um, so basically, uh, Jessica has had trouble identifying objects, um, even though she can draw them out, uh, what is going on with her? And that would you would say, or what lobe of the brain is, is, has an issue with this? And that's where you'd say the occipital lobe stuff like that, rather than the occipital lobe is responsible for X. That's more definitional and I don't prefer definitional questions. I prefer more of the practical questions. All right, in chapter one, 
in, in our intro and methods, we talked about what are the goals of psychology. I would know an overview of those. General details about the different approaches. That's good to know. General details about the high history of psychology. Again, I'm not going to ask dates or specific names without context. The closest I'll get is giving a name with context. Um, general details about the research areas that we talked about in the slides, the scientific method that we talked about in the slides, types of research design, and then finally, ethics in research. That's for chapter one. For chapter five, it's I, I've got chapter five here, but um, I think we're using a different book. It's not chapter five itself, but it's the behaviorism. The first approach is chapter we did. Um, so what are the basics of classical conditioning? Um, taste aversion learning. I love to ask a question about taste aversion learning. Um, we had a slide about that. Uh, I talked about Little Albert, so might be a question about Little Albert. Then operant conditioning basics, um, punishment and reinforcement, both positive and negative for both of those. I think it's coming out weird, the drawing on it, because it's in night mode. Word is in night mode, so it has to adjust when I write to, to then go to night mode. Um, also, extinction, spontaneous recovery, um, stuff like that for both classical and operant conditioning are important. Then social cognitive theory, specifically the Bobo doll experiment. Um, what happened there? What was going on with that? And then since I talked about the challenges to behaviorism, specifically things like instincts and uh, the, the things like that, that's something that could come up as a question. The next section was on personality, approaches to personality. So the basics of personality, I explained some basics of personality. I talked about the big five. I even said in the lecture that, that I like to ask, um, what are the, the big five personality traits? So being able to remember um, ocean is good there. Uh, then we talked about psychoanalytic know the basics of psychoanalytic theory, even though I don't, I'm not a fan of psychoanalytic theory, know the basics of it, know the basics of the projective test, know the basics of the neo-Freudian theories that came about after psychoanalytic, um, especially the ones I emphasize more. Then we talked about humanistic theories and the, the gestalt and positive regard, unconditional positive regard and the hierarchy of need, Maslow, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, stuff like that are good to know. The basics of trait theory, what's going on with that, how we measure things. And then finally, in this week, we covered biology and the evolutionary theory. So for the evolutionary theory basics, um, know what evolution by natural selection is. Survival or reproduction, which one's more important? You can say it now, which one's more important? Reproduction. Yes, reproduction. Yeah. Um, the question was, where are the recordings located again? I don't know how long ago you asked that. It just popped up for me. Um, they, they should be in the weeks. So if you go in the week, you can get the link to them for uh, to uh, YouTube. However, this week's lectures have not been posted yet. I will be posting them later today. I'm just going to post the lecture that we covered in class. So as soon as it converts, it takes about a half an hour for it to convert after the video is over, then I'll upload those two to YouTube and you'll have those two. Um, so then it takes time to upload to YouTube. It takes time for YouTube to convert. But by this evening, the two lectures from this, from the biology stuff should be um, uploaded and on YouTube and linked. So just keep an eye on it tonight or tomorrow. So we did survival or reproduction, then sexual selection. What is sexual selection? That's, that's one of the questions I might ask. And then, of course, the, the stuff we covered today, the brain and nervous system, the basics. This is not a bio class. I'm not going to get too specific on these questions. I just am looking for some basics of the, the brain structures.
Any questions there? Any questions at all? So was class officially like really starting next Wednesday for in-person? Yes. Okay. Yep, the in-person will be next Wednesday unless something changes. Um, I believe that's the last I saw. Um, I can check real quick, but I believe we are back to in-person on as of uh, next Wednesday officially. Uh, what did I say? When did I say? Yep, through two four. So yeah, next uh next Monday we're back in person for the exam, but you can still take it online. Next Wednesday we are back fully in person. However, and I'm going to send out an announcement about this um early next week. Uh I'm going to try the room is set up with Hyperflex. I have not tried Hyperflex before. I have not used it at all, but the room is set up with Hyperflex. So I've been told how to do it. I just have to go in. I'll go in a little bit early on Wednesday and figure out if I can do it. But what my intention is, is when I'm teaching that class, that I'll start a Zoom meeting from the classroom. So students that are in person will be able to see me in person and I'll have a Zoom meeting just like we did these, but it'll be a Zoom meeting for the, the that'll show the actual classroom and show the actual lecture that's going on in the class. I don't know how well that works. I don't know how well the sound is. I don't know what it sees. I've just been told that the Hyperflex is set up in there and I can do it that way. So my intention is to utilize Hyperflex and uh, starting on Wednesday to have a Zoom meeting going at the same time as the lecture's going. Uh, I don't want anyone to come in who, who isn't feeling well, who, who for whatever reason can't come in, um, even if it's just roads, but especially if you're sick, I don't want people getting other people sick. This is something I'll reiterate next week, but I take care of someone that's high risk. Um, everybody's vaccinated, but that doesn't change the fact that that person is high risk and I don't wanna risk getting sick to get them potentially sick. So it's just something when, if you're, if we're doing in person and you don't feel well at all, you think you, you, you might be sick. And I'm not even just talking about COVID here. Even the flu can be bad for people that are high risk. So it's, it's one of those where I just want to keep them safe. So if you guys can help keep me safe, that helps keep them safe. And I'll reiterate that next week. Any other questions? Okay, that's all I got. I'll hang out for a minute.